Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Thacker Sunday Hangover with me, James Thacker. It's good to be speaking to you again. I hope you're doing well. I hope that everyone is staying sane and looking forward to seeing more people as we kind of get through lockdown and work through the the phases of kind of back to play, I suppose, as, as rugby players and sportsmen would turn it, uh, term it. Um, I hope everyone's having a good week. Today, the topic of conversation um, is actually going to be one that's extremely personal to me. And I'm going to be talking through my experience and my story with rugby, my on-off love affair with rugby specifically. And I know that I talked about sport and sport in general as to why it's more than just a game. But today I wanted to go a bit deeper into how I started playing, my whole journey through rugby. Um, I was fortunate enough throughout my career and, you know, have been fortunate enough, I'm still playing, uh, to have played for County, uh, for Hertfordshire, for Saracens Academy for a number of years, which is a, a period of my life which I look back very, very fondly on. I managed to, when I was 16, uh, reached the dizzy heights of, of of England and managed to win myself two caps, um, which was, you know, without doubt the proudest you know moment of my life to this day. And and then you know having been released from Saracens under eighteen level, then how I kind of fell out of love with rugby for a while, especially as I went through rugby at university, trials and tribulations there. How I kind of just fell out of all love for the sport and. And, and lost my way a little bit and then how I've kind of found my path back to this wonderful sport and hopefully you know it will act as a little bit of a a story time for you hopefully if someone's going through similar you know a similar stage in which I went through where I was really struggling with rugby or struggle to keep persevering um, that there is a way out and there's a way that there's light at the end of the tunnel throughout any period of adversity it doesn't last forever. And so I wanted to share my story. Hopefully you find it interesting. Um, it's something that I haven't talked about broadly before. I've talked to, I've talked to you know, family and friends about it before. But you know what? Hopefully it's interesting. And uh, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll just kick straight off. So when I was eight years old, um, it was when I first got introduced to a rugby ball. Uh, it was when we first started playing at school. But Dad took me down to the local rugby club, Bishop Stortford Rugby Club, and I I never really liked tag rugby much. Is what that's when you start. Um, so under eights is where you start tag rugby. You wear a belt with two tags on, and instead of tackling each other, you just rip off one of the tags, and that's to stop injuries at an early stage and to stop kids being turned off of the sport. Any problem with that is that when I was a lot younger, I was a lot porkier and not as quick as some of the other kids. And so I often found myself being caught up to very, very easily compared to some of the speedsters, which kind of made me think, oh, well, I, I don't quite like this very much because, uh, yeah, I, I don't seem to be that good. I could pass a ball, I could get the fundamental skills, but when it came to uh, evading the tackle, uh, that's where I struggled a little bit. <laughs> so tag rugby was never much for me, but when we progressed into... Uh, tackling and and the more physical side of things due to me being a little bit uh, you know taller and a bit bigger than the rest of the lads I managed to kind of level out those skills a bit Um, and and yeah I I kind of found my feet a little bit more and and started to really progress progress my skills it's something that I enjoyed doing every week going and seeing my mates on a Sunday Um, you know two hour sessions just rolling around in the mud having a good time. I mean, when you're younger, you, you know, training is never really that serious. You're, you're usually playing a lot of games and it's supposed to be fun, right? So at those very early stages of uh, my rugby playing days, I look back on it massively fondly. Um, and it was also at a time, so I really started to uh, pick up rugby at the time that England won the World Cup in 2003. So, you know, I mean, what a time to be growing up in England as a young rugby player. I think the the 2003 World Cup win has really helped to grow the brand of rugby and and to grow its popularity. Um, I think, you know, everyone knows that up until now, you know, and e- even going forward, football will be the dominating sport in this country, just to how wide it's played and, and the history to do with it um, and how long it's been a professional game. But, you know, having people to look up to like Johnny Wilkinson, 
Martin Johnson, uh, Jason Robinson, these kind of icons of the game. Um, it was absolutely fantastic, super inspiring for me to see. Um, <laughs> there was there was a dress up day. I remember at the school shortly after England lifted the World Cup, and all the buzz had been about Johnny Wilkinson. You ask anyone that went through that time in, in your life um, when England were playing and, and Johnny Wilkinson was playing. I mean, he, he was super iconic, one of the best rugby players of all time um, and and with his own individual style. And, and I think actually when you're younger, when you see the way he kicks, uh, it's kind of like, it's really unique with his arms kind of outstretched and clasped and everyone was trying to emulate the way he used to kick. And um but, but he was the kind of only one that people wanted to identify with. And I knew that uh, if, during this dress-up day, I think it was something to do with sport. Everyone was going to come as Johnny Wilkinson. And I thought, you know what, well, that's not fair because there were, rugby's a team game and it, it wasn't all down to him that we won the World Cup, although the drop goal, the pivotal moment in that 2017 win against the Aussies was, you know, stand out in everyone's memory. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to be go dressed as Matt Dawson instead because he passed it to Johnny so he, he deserves some of the plaudits right and uh, I think I was the only one dressed as Matt Dawson but yeah shout out to Matt Dawson who I actually also had a training session with when I was 12 I was fortunate enough to um, to be friends with someone who won a training session with Matt Dawson through a charity raffle um, or a charity geek and <laughs> I don't think he was best pleased with me because when he first got the boys around that were part of this training session. I kind of stood behind him and Matt Dawson, not known for his height. And at 12 years old, I was going through a premature growth spurt and I stood behind him as I was already taller than him. And he turned around and he was like, what, what are you doing? I went, Oh, I'm, uh, I'm just taller. And he said, Oh, well, that's something that impresses you. Is it? I went, Oh, no, 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 sir. So, uh, yeah, quickly went back in my shell and uh, I was like, oh no, I've, I've annoyed Matt Dawson. Um, but yeah, there you go. So Matt Dawson, not that you would ever be listening to this, but wherever you are, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for pissing you off about the height thing. Um, but I enjoyed the day none the same and at least I know how to dive past now. <laughs> I, I, you know, going back to my playing experience at under nines is something that stands out in my memory and, and why rugby is so great. And I think again, helped me to build an affinity with the sport. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably, you know, admittedly quite soft-hearted. Um, I'm not a rugby player that likes to go around being a, a massive nose to, you know, try and hurt people. I, tr- I like the more flamboyant side of the game. I like the camaraderie. I like the teamship. Um, I obviously like working hard and I'll do do a, a good job. I, you know, my work rate on the field is, is good, I think. Um but I, I, you know, I like the teamship. I like the, the the nicer sides of rugby and why it's such a great sport. Um, I remember playing in a tournament, it's, uh, the Saint Columbus tournament under nines. And when you're younger, you play in these festivals and these tournaments that last all day long. You'll be there from ten in the morning until five at night, and you'll be playing rugby all day long with some breaks in between matches to go maybe buy a hot dog or some sweets to keep you going. But by the end of the day, you're absolutely knackered and when we reached the final of the St. Columbus tournament, I think one of my teammates must have been quite overwhelmed because you could see he was getting a little bit emotional, a little, little bit heated, and I think he actually started to cry. And it's funny because in any normal situation, I think lots of kids might not know how to react to that. I think we might have been looking to the coach or to parents to maybe help that, but something amazing happened when we were nine and is something that I always remember is us kind of putting our arm around that teammate and saying, you know, we can do this, you know, giving you some emotional support and really got round him. And, you know, we actually managed to kind of recover and, and win the game. And for me, that's just sticks out in my memory as to, and it encompasses the reasons why rugby is such a fantastic game. We're all in it together. You're all looking out for each other. It's not a place for individuals. We all need to pull through. Um, it's also a place where it teaches you to look after one another, you know, because when you, when one of you fails, you all fail when, when one, you know, and you succeed as a team. So um, that, that was the first kind of memory in my mind as to like kind of why rugby is such a great game. And I think even from an early stage, I had an appreciation of that. And that's, 
you know, I, I always love the camaraderie of the sport. I think then moving on a little bit to um, my first kind of taste of success was at school with under um, the under 11 team. I was playing a year up. Um, the year above me at the Bishop Stortford College was an unbelievable year group. You had some players in there who are still fantastic rugby players. And it just, it felt like we had a supernatural um, year group in that year where the players, most of them were pl- would go on to play at a higher level. So you've got players like Tom Wollstonecroft, who plays now for Saracens. Um, you know, you've got people, uh, you know, littered with the uh, the Bishop Stortford first team now. Um, and, you know, most of them would have gone through Saracens Academy, County, you know, England or international age groups. I mean, the talent was absolutely ridiculous. So to play alongside some of those guys throughout my kind of youth was, you know, fantastic for me because it was always like I was playing catch up in a way. And, you know, you're always chasing the the older guys to try and get better, to try and match their physicality, their skill, their strength. So it was a experience that I relished. And uh, under 11s, we, we played a, in an IAPS national rugby tournament. Again, it was one of these tournaments that lasted all day. Um, and actually, I, I spent a lot of the tournament on the bench and came on for spells where uh, the, the probably the, the first teamers or the starters needed the rest. Um, but I played well when I came on and, you know, I, th- I think I very much contributed towards our success on the day. And, you know, we ended up winning the final, which was the first kind of major medal, you know, to win a national competition. Um, you know, super exciting when you're younger, you come back into school and you kind of, you know, Billy Big Bollocks a little bit and you think you're feeling yourself massively. Um, but it felt, it, you know, it felt so good to have that taste of victory. And when you're younger, I mean, it's obviously difficult. You also have your fair share of defeats as well. And you've got to learn to be a good loser. I've, I've never been that great of a loser. It usually ruins my weekend or my day if uh, if I've lost a game. So maybe that's something that <laughs> I could have learned a bit better throughout my youth. But um, so so I, I started really enjoying rugby. Um, and I was still playing at the rugby club, but it got to a point where at the rugby club, the coaches that were on on board or, or coaching us, um, when things started to get a bit more competitive, I, you know, they were super, super negative and shouty. And it was very old school in terms of the old school mentality of give them a bollock and if they're doing badly um, and, you know, don't show too much emotion when they're doing well. Uh, a very old school approach to coaching and I remember vividly having some absolute bollockings when I wasn't playing well. And I, that's something that I've never reacted well to. I've never reacted well to, you know, being cast out or having my kind of flaws exposed and, you know, flaunted in front of the rest of the team to be embarrassed or, you know, to be shouted at. I I think I respond best to, to an arm around the shoulder and, you know, let's, let's be open and honest with the criticism, but, you know, anger and frustration is just a way to make me more angry frustrated uh, and not to react positively so I I got turned off the sport for that reason when I was 11 and and come under 12s I actually decided to turn to football which is another uh, massive passion in my life Um, and I started to play for a football club instead Um, now I don't know why at 12 years old, I thought that turning to football would reduce the amount of negativity or swearing in my life <laughs> because I have never been in an atmosphere like there is a Sunday league football. Um, if you can call, you know, age group football, Sunday league football. I was absolutely amazed at the colourful language that was used, not just towards referees on the weekend, but also towards the kids. It was something that, at the time I thought this is just unbelievable. I don't understand, you know, we're just playing football here. Why are the parents getting so animated and so nasty on the sidelines? I, I didn't get it. So as much as I might have enjoyed the football side of things, the community spirit that rugby brings, um, especially with the parents, with, with the players, you know, it was, it was just too toxic and, um, that side of it, I didn't enjoy at all. And, and my football coach, I remember as much as he was a nice guy away from football, 
from the minute one to minute 90 or however long we played, it just would not stop shouting the entire time. It, it was like there was no ability to go and just play yourself. It was like you were getting micromanaged to the nth degree. And as a player that likes to have a bit of responsibility and trust put in them, I wanted to just play without having every single thing I did and micromanaged. And and so, yeah, I, I, I suppose I really... As much as I, I played well and, you know, I managed to score some goals and I, I always think, yeah, football was probably not for me and I was always leaning towards rugby. I think some of my friends tried to persuade me to come back to the rugby club and after a season where I broke my finger and my wrist at under 12s, which led to a very disjointed, weird football year experience, um, I decided to return to rugby at under 13s. Um, because I was taller, I was stronger and, and faster and, and re- just ready to play rugby again. Also, the old coaches that I the, was the reason why I left the rugby club were no longer there. And I think it was then an environment which I, I felt comfortable to come back to, uh, come back to, which was probably the best decision I could have made because I think, realistically, if we're being honest, I was never going to make it in football. I don't have the frame. I don't have the speed. I probably don't have much of the skill either. So, um, yeah, it's probably like good that I came back to rugby. And from there, at 13 years old, was where I really started to find my form and find my, I suppose, I was in my element a little bit more. Um, I, I was actually playing at outside centre, which I'm sure if you've only kind of known me of recent years and recent times, will probably be a surprise to you because I actually play number eight or second row now. But actually, back in the day, I did have a turn of pace. Um, I feel bad for the wingers, though, that used to play outside me because they very, very seldom saw the ball unless there was a chance for me to take two players on and then Sonny Bill will offload out the back door. <laughs> um, but yeah, so sorry, guys, if you're if you're listening to this for, for never giving you the ball. Um, but yeah, I remember a tournament vividly, which kind of changed my perception of rugby and, and maybe where I started to take it more seriously. There was a... a a festival actually that Bishop Stortford Rugby Club hosted. Um, And I remember that day I was just scoring tries for fun. It was one of those days where everything was just going right. I I used to kick as well. So every kick was going over, even from the touchline, every offload, you know, I was winning line outs, you know, you name it, it was, it was coming off. And um, I, I think come the end of the day, I think we won the tournament and I sat down, we sat down for a little bit of the debrief from the coaches. I think it was the end of season awards I won coach's player of the season. And um, from there on, I think I just took, rug- I started to take rugby a bit more seriously. I think it was something I saw as, you know, okay, this this is a hobby, but, you know, let's see how, how far I can maybe take this. Um, I think it was when dad as well maybe started to push me a little bit more. And, and certainly my coaches at school started to push me a little bit more. And we, we were just in discussions. I I didn't know too much about the rugby system at this point in terms of what was needed to, to make it. I mean, there are many, many avenues in which you can make it in professional sport. But um, back back when you're at that age, uh, I think when you're trying to figure out, okay, so what's the next step on from club rugby? Um, I, I, I didn't even know of anything like county or the school of rugby or EPDG systems that we have in this country. Um. But at 14, I was picked up by um, Hertfordshire School of Rugby. I think I was submitted by my club coaches. And it was a bit of a confusing time because we weren't actually aware as players if the School of Rugby was better or worse than playing county level. But nonetheless, everyone in that environment was extremely testosterone-filled. In that competitive environment, when you're playing with people you don't usually play with at a young age, and you're trying to suss each other out. It's one of the most tense environments you're ever part of, and that that never really went away throughout my teenage years. You you know, you don't have the full fully built social skills. Some people are much more advanced, but you can't really just strike up a conversation when you when you're younger with uh, with other people you don't know. So when you're in trial situations, I I can remember vividly going into these dark, danky changing rooms. No one's saying anything. Some people might have their headphones in, but back then you didn't. We didn't really have the technology or anything that was so kind of, I suppose, uh, common as it is today. Where you'd go in, you might just have your headphones in already, or you listen to your iPod Touch or whatever. You know, 
it wasn't really the done thing. So you go in, no eye contact, no one's talking to everyone, just head down, wait till the coaches tell you what to do. And so already you just, you could cut the tension with a knife because you know in a minute you've got to go around and belt these blokes. You've got to go and show that you're better than the other man because everyone's just here to be super competitive. You know, at this stage, you're not, you're there to have fun to a degree, but you want to make the next level. So it's, everything's a competition, even down to, you know, people assessing what other people are having as nutrition, how big they are, um, you know, the kind of kit they're wearing. I mean, I remember that was massive. I was always so much more intimidated, even, you know, still am to, to, a, to a degree. If someone had like done their hair well, if they looked after themselves, if they got swish boots, if they absolutely looked the part, I was always automatically already intimidated because I thought, if you're worried about that, then you've already got your ability locked down. <laughs> like, if you've already taken the time to do your hair today, then you're not even worried about the uh, the rugby side of things. So automatically, I'm already keeping my eye out for these guys. Um, and it was it was you know it was a really interesting time. Um, I I absolutely loved the journey through the county system. Um, it was it was always a, a testing period when you're going through trials, but then when when you finally get through that trial period, coming together with people from different clubs and being part of that um, you know representative setup where you know you know you've only got a limited amount of time together, so let's just go out and play some rugby, let's go and enjoy it, um, you know let's build some relationships. Uh, you've got to do it quickly as well, so there's a, a good level of team bonding, sharing experiences, um, and it was a fantastic time. I was playing for Hertfordshire uh, from the ages of under 14 to under 16. And I played with a lot of the same guys throughout that whole time. And I have to say that throughout that time, we had some really fantastic experiences together. Um, we, we kind of matured as rugby players together. We, you know, um, we made some fantastic memories. And if anyone that I used to play Hertfordshire rugby with is listening, I'd be keen to grab a pint anytime because you all are such a fantastic bunch of blokes. Um, And it's a time in my life where I look back on really, really fondly. I have to say the the matches themselves were always filled with pressure because you felt that every time you were representing your county, you had to perform. You never knew, you know, which eyes were watching you. You didn't want to let your teammates down. And also when, you know, I think the higher you climb within sport, I think you probably put more pressure on yourself as an athlete because you want to, you know, you want to show that you can make it at that level and you want to show that, you know, you deserve to be there. So there was always a bit of added pressure. Um, but when you won a county game, I mean, there was no better feeling. And um, I'm sure, sure the guys that I played with would share that sentiment. When it came to under 16 time, um, that was when it really cranked up a notch when we were trialling for England. But that's something I'll, I'll come on to a bit later. Um, I remember one day at the Hart School of Rugby when I was around 14 uh, years old, I was approached by the, after afterwards, uh, after the session concluded, I was approached by the EPDG manager at Saracens. I didn't actually know who he was at the time, um, but he called me aside and he said, you know, you trained really well. Um, we really want to invite you along to train with Saracens this summer, are you keen? And I didn't really know what to say because to be honest, at that time, I didn't really know what Saracens was, but I knew it was a big deal. And I used to see these massive Saracens guys walking around at Old Albanians Rugby Club, which is where we used to train for county and the School of Rugby. And I thought, okay, you know, this 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 seems like it's a pretty big deal. So I asked my dad, you know, should I go for it? He said, yes, absolutely, you should. Stupid question. And and come the summer, I was uh, I was then driving to St Albans to go and go and train with the Saracens Academy, which uh, you know was a was a massive wake up call to me because it definitely taught me that I'm not as big or strong or fast as I thought I was, and definitely not as good at rugby um, as I thought I was. But it was a fantastic learning curve for me because I was really thrown in at the deep end. For some reason, the coaching staff decided it was a good idea just because I was a bit taller and probably looked like I could muscle it with the the older guys to get me in training with the under 18s for the summer and it was an unbelievably intimidating experience there was guys that had been there you know you could tell that they'd been in the gym um, guys that were 
studying at Oakland's College, which is the Saracens kind of um, sister college or is where they, you know, housed or worked with a lot of the guys as they went through school and education, but with a large, large focus around rugby and hitting the gym and being able to train. And these guys were, you know, light years, it felt ahead of me in terms of physicality. And, um, you know, I definitely felt like, wow, this is this is just a whole nother ball game now. Um, one of the, the, the most vivid memories from that summer, I remember us having to do a conditioning circuit. And Saracens, I think, were notorious and, and probably still are, to be honest, for just having an absolutely ruthless strength and conditioning process because... Quite rightly, you know, when you're in a rugby game, you have to be prepared to, you know, push your body to the limits. And so the S&C programs were built there, uh, built to be able to do that. On my life, I, I've i never experienced anything like I did that day. So the idea was there was eight stations, and I think we went three rounds via eight stations. Each station, I think you were working at for two minutes or maybe one minute. One minute was probably enough. Um, so you had things like sled drive. So if anyone knows what a scrum machine looks like, you'd be driving that for about a minute with your partner. Um, you'd also have one where you've got a massive crash mat, which uh, athletes who do that um, high jump, they'll they'll crash onto. And so it'd be high knees on that, which massively drains your legs for, for a minute. Um, you might just be doing shuttles for a minute, push-ups. And then there was one, which was a boxing session where you'd literally just hit, try and hit each, each other as hard as possible for a minute. So I'm looking around before we start the session and everyone's pairing up with people of a similar position. And there was one guy who didn't, no one flocked to, uh, to grab a partner because he was a genuine maniac. I mean, this guy, I, I can't remember his name, um, but you know, even so, it's probably best to, to leave his name out of it. He was such a lovely guy off the pitch. He really was, and it's someone that I looked up to. But you have these people in rugby who can be so lovely off the pitch, but on the pitch, they're absolute maniacs. And guess who got paired up with him? Yep, this guy right here. And I was just looking at that boxing station like, oh, for God's sake, here we go. So already quite out of my depth, definitely not as strong as, as him. And so I, I tried to keep up. And to be fair to myself, I, I was doing all right um, <laughs> all the way through until we got to this boxing this boxing set. And this guy was just absolutely going hell for leather. Every time that I tried to punch him, he'd uppercut me and bruise my nose. And then it got to the point where I wasn't landing any punches. I was just curled up trying to you know avoid getting hit. So he said, come on then, hit me. God hit me. I went, what? He's like, God hit me. He was just offering me his face and he just wanted me to punch him in the head. Every time I punched him in the head, he punched me in the head. And honestly, it was an absolutely, um, it felt like a psychotic episode. Um, fantastic for the old resilience building, but yeah, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't, sometimes I look back on my experience with Saracens and think, yeah, I don't really miss those days much, <laughs> but it was fantastic character building. And, the whole round process was, geez, it was meant to exhaust you. Every day during that summer, I was coming back home absolutely exhausted. It, it was a tough, it was a tough time, but a time that I saw massive value out of because it took my fitness to the next level. So I suppose talking about Saracens, it'd probably be good to segment it off into a few areas. I, th- I suppose the, fir- the, the best place and the first place to start were is on the pitch um and the actual training aspect now i i absolutely loved every minute that i managed to spend with saracens whether it was in the training or playing capacity the level of coaching that i got is something that i'll never forget some of the things that you learn from some of the expertise and the people that i got to work with i'll never forget and you know it, it was being you know it was being able to work with people like richard hill who you know when when you spend more time studying the game and learning the game, um, is one of the players that I massively looked up to when I was growing up. He was part of the 2003 World Cup winning squad. To have a mentor like that, someone that was willing to put their time into me, to actually go go and coach me. I remember actually, you know, he, he was so good as to one day actually drive to my house and 
Um, I remember in the preparation for his visit, mum and dad frantically cleaning the house. It was like the queen was coming to visit. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was fantastic for him to just even be sitting at my kitchen table going running through some some analysis with me before then going out to the rugby club pitches and, and running through some drills. Um, those, those kind of memories will, will last forever. And as a young as a young guy, yeah, you can't ask for anything more at that stage. You just think this is this is amazing. What an opportunity! It was one that I tried to make the most of every time I stepped out on training. And they trained us hard at Saracens. They really did. I remember every summer we used to um, give up, and we were in there Monday to Friday, maybe with a half day on a Wednesday. We'd get in uh, probably eight thirty for an eight thirty weigh in. Um, and you, I think we had to do a wee test to make sure that we were hydrated. So I was necking two litres of water in the on the hour drive uh, from when I woke up to when I arrived. Um, and then the weigh in to make sure that you were uh, you were growing or to you know maintaining weight and to make sure that we were going on the right track. And then straight away nine o'clock. Most days we had uh, something called combat conditioning which still sends shivers down my spine, and I'm sure it will do. It will bring back some colourful memories to a lot of members who who was part of that Saracens um, team when I was playing. Um, combat conditioning was essentially 30 minutes of just pure hell. Um, and, and in the morning, you know, what better time to go through it? I think it, it definitely... So the, the reason why we did it was twofold. One, to just develop us into hard bastards. I mean, Saracens just wanted you know, at the time to develop us into really hard players um, who were super, super physical because that's exactly what you need to become a professional rugby player and to test your mental strength as well because when you think about it, you get in straight away, nine o'clock in the morning, you're already beating each other up. So combat conditioning would have been things like um, they'll call out our body parts, so you get into pairs, calling out a body part and then as hard as you ha- can, you've got to slap that body part and the s coaches at the time Absolutely love that drill. Don't know why. <laughs> um, and then we had, you know, endless amounts of sprawls, then lots of activities where you're climbing on each other and doing body weight type stuff. And it's essentially to put you flat out um, for about 30 minutes. And that was the start of our day. We'd then go on to things like speed drills. So we look at the mechanics of the way that you um, run. And so hopefully to improve our speed, you then probably move on to about an hour or so of rugby. So took, you know, going through um, tactical drills and technical drills. And it was always a good day when the the rugby session was uh, low on contact or light on contact because after a half an hour of, uh, of combat conditioning, you don't quite fancy going around and beat each other up in loads of contract, contact drills again. Um, and during the height of summer, when the ground was harder, you usually got to escape it. Now that uh, the, they've got the 4G pitches, though, I don't know how much the guys do escape uh, that anymore. So maybe uh, maybe someone can come and correct me on that. Um, then during lunch, that would be usually uh, consisting of a meal that you've made yourselves. And they'll be coming around checking the nutrition to make sure that we're all re- eating the right things. Uh, and making sure that we're eat- you know getting the right macros and the nutrition in and you'd be obviously encouraged to eat a lot because when you're training that much and, you know, burning through that much workload, um, that requires a lot of fueling. So you'd usually be eating quite a lot at lunchtime. After lunchtime, we'd then be probably back out for a gym session uh, with a bit more conditioning. So it would be either conditioned games or, you know, doing some kind of fitness in the afternoon and followed by a bit more rugby and then going home for around five o'clock. So if you think about, that was going on for pretty much every day for every week during our summers off. Um, so it required a you know high level of dedication. There were definitely times in that journey where I was getting up at six o'clock on summers where all my mates were just chilling out, having fun. <laughs> Not, you know, everyone at school just having a great time and every day we just kind of getting up to go beat each other up. It was it was tough, but then at the same time, you're always in the back of your mind, like this is it, this this is this is the dream. You're part of um, the Saracen setup, you know. Don't take this opportunity for granted. There were a few times where I was begging my parents not to take me to training, but then reluctantly got in the car anyway because I knew that I, you know, I'd kick myself later if I missed a day of training and just persevered with it. During the season, 
Um, we train midweek, so it would be uh, either a Monday or a Tuesday session after school. And then alongside all your other rugby commitments, it was usually tough to fit everything in, but managed to do it somehow. And, you know, the 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 support I had from my parents, from my teammates' parents to be able to do all of that is something, again, I'll, I'll never forget because the amount of coordination it takes to actually get, you know, going to all these places on a weekly basis games training is so much time on the road and I think you, we as rugby players at the time you don't appreciate how much time out of their week uh, you know people that are traveling there it is out of their uh, week so yeah it it takes a lot of effort and more than just one person to uh, to help make you an athlete so that's something that I'd urge current players going through you know especially your teenage years where you're still relying on your um, your parents a lot to thank them more than I probably thank mine um, because they're super important and you definitely can't do it without them. Um, but yeah, my, my in, most enjoyable rugby was played with Saracens. I remember going um, on some trips to Wales. Um, I remember we went camping there uh, on, on trips. It was you know always a fantastic time um, getting around the campfire in the evenings telling stories we were playing rugby on the beach having stupid competitions and then littered in between that there was a few rugby games against Newport Gwent Dragons where I managed to get into my first proper fight um yeah obviously the the Welsh boys knew the English were coming and were very riled up minute two someone landed the first punch and uh obviously me trying to prove prove uh I think I was 15 at the time playing up a couple of years and I uh, wanted to prove that I could uh, <laughs> slam it with the big boys. So uh, got swinging and thankfully didn't get caught. Um, but yeah, definitely was on the wrong side of a few punches that day. Um, but all along, I just loved playing that that level of rugby. It was where I felt in my element. Everyone took it really seriously, which, um, you know, although we like to have fun, I liked, you know, I tried to be a student of the game as much as I could. I loved drilling down in the detail how I could get better all the time. The coaches were demanding that and and it's something that, you know, you're always looking to do week on week, always improve your, your performance. Um, you're looking into, you know, the detail of every single thing you do from the past, tackle, scrum, line out, everything. You, you'd analyse your performance afterwards and I'd actually keep a note of how I played as well. So I'd, after each game, I'd go and reflect, see how I can go and be better and we were encouraged to do that. So, uh yeah, that was that was definitely a useful process for me. Um, and then going going through and getting a little bit older, um, experiencing the um, academy premiership, which was something that got brought in when I was seventeen, and I was privileged to be part of the Saracen squad for two years that played in the academy premiership in the in the first couple of years that it was introduced. This was an extremely exciting prospect for us because it was like having a mini premiership and getting to compete against other academies is something that we didn't tend to do um, very much during the season. So having kind of regular games where we could go and test our abilities against the best was was awesome. And it was a platform that we were able to go and prove that, yes, we were worth the contract. And, um, you know, what a fantastic experience to go and test yourself against the best. It was an opportunity. Every time I pulled on that Saracen shirt, it was something that filled me with, you know, immense pride and um, I look back on on those memories really, really fondly. Um, and the coaches as well. The coaches, are, you know, I whenever I see them or, you know, hopefully I'll see them in the future, but thanking them for, you know, how much time and effort they put in. Um, I, I love learning from people um, in, in that group. Um, it was it was a fun, fantastic experience. I, you know, it's something that you don't forget. And... Um, yeah, extremely grateful uh, to be able to be in that position. Off the pitch, it was just as intense as on the pitch. So from a pure kind of um, SNC and gym perspective, we used to get given programs to do um, by the SNC coaches and and these guys. I remember the, the guys that used to coach us, the SNC guys, Saracens employed unbelievably energetic um, SNC characters who are always so much more energetic about SNC and conditioning and gym than you were, and then <laughs> so I was always made to feel quite bad that I was not quite as enthusiastic about crawling off a sled or throwing up after a brutal conditioning session as they were. But they loved to see it, and 
I'm I'm sure these guys were were crazy, but you know they they drove the best out of us. Um, I remember really cool experiences. So they used to put on sessions about how to cook your own food. So I remember after a, a gym session, we actually learned how to, you know, when you're younger. I know this is going to sound really primitive and probably quite basic um, to a lot of adults listening, but when you're younger and you don't actually know how to cook you know, being able to learn how to cook things like scrambled egg, which is, you know, a good breakfast food, um, being able to learn how to, you know, make protein balls, which were kind of little snacky treats that you could have throughout the day. Those little one percenters were really fantastic in terms of our development, but also just made rugby and the whole thing that's surrounding it a bit more exciting. Um, you could You could kind of rely on yourself a little bit more rather than relying on my parents. So even though my parents still looked after me massively from a nutrition aspect. I definitely didn't do enough myself, but being able to have the tools to be able to do all these things, you know, was really fantastic and having the recipes and being able to put this. So I, I remember that. So off the field, they looked after us massively as well. I remember the nutrition, they were quite stringent with that. And I remember, you know, as someone that puts on weight really easily and um, struggles to, to take it off, I had to be careful with what I was eating, although when you're younger, you're burning so many calories and um, you're doing so much activity that usually whatever you eat, it's going to be burnt off. Um, But it was actually just knowing what types of foods are going to do what to the body, Um, giving us that knowledge and and trying to stick to that. It was, you know, getting really down to the granular level. Again, it was it was something that I'd never really experienced before and having seminars and you know, nutrition packs given to us. It was, again, something that I really appreciated as a player. Sometimes, you know, didn't stick to because I love my food. Um, but I definitely, definitely didn't appreciate how much rugby players drink because when I was younger, I didn't drink anything. And that was just because I was like, well, beer is bad. Beer is what old people drink. And, you know, I know that's definitely not what Johnny Wilkinson and Aaron Farrell will be drinking at the weekend, so I'm not going to drink it ever. So I pretty much went teetotal to a degree um, whenever I was in season and, and even most of the off season, to be honest, um, until one of my s c coaches came up to me uh, in sixth form and he said, Fax, do you realise how much rugby players drink at a weekend? I went, oh, wait, what? And he said, yeah, these guys are absolutely slamming them down on the weekend after a win, I was like, oh, it's like, yeah, because you think about the amount of calories that you're burning throughout a game. I think, oh, right. So that was a little bit of license to have a couple in the weekend at least. And uh, and uni, quite a lot more. Uh, but that's a whole different story altogether. <laughs> um, and that's how I, I grew to be 125 kgs. I'll come on to that though. Um, there's another side of off the pitch um, with, with the team environment. And I remember... When you're on downtime and out of earshot of the coaches, it can be a really intimidating place. And as someone who I was the only person from my town or my club in my age group that played for Saracens Academy. And at times it was quite a lonely place because I didn't, although I had some friends there as much as we were kind of rugby teammates I didn't I wouldn't see them at the weekend or anything like that so we weren't massively close other guys did have that in the Saracen setup and and it could occasionally be cliquey like it can be cliquey at any rugby club people will have their friend groups it happens all over the place any sports team it will have its clicks but sometimes when you know you, especially when you're looking at older age groups and you see the cool kids table and um, people that really used to feel themselves. I never really kind of felt like I fit in a lot. And sometimes it was challenging from a social aspect when you've got to go and train with these guys and play with them and um, and you don't really feel like you fit in off the pitch from a social aspect. It was quite challenging to keep kind of keeping your head down, doing your own things, trying to stay focused on what was important and what you're there to do. But it, I suppose it would have... Um, it would have been nicer to have people that I'd see other than just on the rugby pitch. Um, but at the same time, learning to be independent is good. I, I wouldn't say that I, I massively suffered at the back of it, but it was still an intimidating place. And um, it at times you could definitely feel it when you weren't part of that inner circle. And um, sometimes I could get bantered about my weight 
um, about the way I looked. You know, that's something that hasn't stopped. But when you're younger, I think it has a lot more weighing on your brain than it does when you're older and you just kind of learn to accept how you look a bit more. I think, you know, small comments probably meant a lot to me from some of the guys I looked up to the most. And I'd remember them probably a lot more than they thought in terms of that, you know, what whatever uh, a, a pass off comment or a throwaway comment would have been to them. I actually would have taken to heart because of how highly I regarded some of these guys. And, and so it, it maybe that was to my detriment where I should have probably taken the weight off of what they were saying. Um, maybe it was the fact that I wasn't in with the in crowd, but you know, at the same time, this, that, that those are the kind of things that build character. They, they, you know, help you to develop a, another layer of skin. Something that I still haven't massively mastered because there are times where things still get to me, but it's about how you deal with them and, um, and, and how much weight you suppose you give to their words. I had a really kind of um, wise saying from someone, I can't remember, and this is probably going to undercut the the value of this quote, but um, it was, don't take criticism from people that you wouldn't go to for advice for, um, which, yeah, I think, you know, I massively resonate with that saying because, you know, why are you going to let someone that, you know, you don't value the opinion of, because you don't, you, if you don't go to advice for them, if you don't rate their opinion, because you don't respect them, and obviously you can't, you can't just go and adv- ask advice from people that are going to be yes men, and you know, you, you know, they're going to tell you the answer that you want to hear. But it's from the people that are going to be honest and open with you. But if if you're not going to go to them for advice, then why would you take their criticism? And you know, some some of these guys, you know, they 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 would just call me out but there were no there were never going to be anyone that I should have really taken it from but some of these guys they they did tell some truth sometimes yeah the criticism is justified sometimes they'll call me out on how I played sometimes how many stupid offloads that I threw during a training session and sometimes it does it is warranted so to a degree I you know you need that kind of atmosphere in the training uh, in the uh, in the in the changing room um but it's a high pressure environment I mean if you think about when you're a teenage kid, you're full of testosterone anyway and, you know, a lot of frustration. I mean, rugby is a massive, you know, kind of macho game where everyone's trying to prove how manly they can be. And, you know, when you're a young guy, you want to be the coolest. So you're trying to show off in front of your mates. You're trying to show you can be the biggest, strongest, most skillful all the time. So there's a lot of um, testosterone-filled energy in that room um and sometimes it could come to blow sometimes it could get too much sometimes it can um, breed arguments but at the same time I think it's also how you can challenge yourself more challenge others progress as a team you know if you've got an issue then it's going to get vocalized rather than just sat on for for ages and you know what that that's sometimes what teams have got to go through to get better so um yeah it was interesting it was really interesting to be part of that environment some days really good some days not so good, but you learn from those bad days and um, capitalize on the good ones. Going through Saracens was, was a fantastic experience for me and it put me in the light a little bit, um, especially when it came to trial processes for representational stuff beyond county. So after county level, you then look to regional. And so there are regional trials, which similar to county, extremely tense affairs. Sometimes those those regional trials could last for days. Um, and you're coming from not just all over the county now, you're coming from all over the region. So in the southeast where I'm based, there were so many more kids at this trial now. And you're thinking, oh, OK, I'm no longer a bigger fish in a small pond. I'm a small fish in a massive pond. And um, it would kind of then was like okay right well now it's time to step up we go again uh, in terms of challenging myself in order to get to southeast we needed to play a number of uh, games beforehand though i remember there was criteria that were marked out before the the games that were to say you know if you're a four or five you're a good county player if you're a six then you're a very good county player or, you know, you're, you're a regional player, seven, maybe England, and then eight, nine, and 10. I think it was literally unachievable because you'd be like, you're the best in the country or you're destined for greatness or something stupid like that. Um, I remember playing against 
uh, some counties in these kind of trial games and we'd be judged by South Feast. It was a weird experience, you know, playing rugby essentially for, like as a pageant. It was it was quite superficial in a way because you might be doing things or you might be doing selfish things that otherwise in a normal rugby game you wouldn't do. But because you've got only a finite amount of time to show your worth and show your value in that game, you're going to do because you have to show X, Y, Z criteria to, f- to get onto the next stage. Um, which probably led to me being a little bit selfish, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it, I guess it paid off to a degree. Um, I remember after the Essex game where I had a, a bit of a good game, I think I might have scored the winning try. Um, and my good friend Musa actually, uh, it was weird. So I didn't realise at the time, but I played against my eventual university roommate um, during this game in Essex, which we look back on now and laugh because... At the time, we had no idea. didn't even remember until we looked at pictures years later. Um, so it's, fu- it's funny how small the world is sometimes. But anyway, I digress. So I had a look over the shoulder at the end of this game of my coach. I felt like I had a good game. I think I stood a pretty good chance of making Southeast trials. I had a seven against my name, which I knew was good. I don't know whether it was England or, or whatever, but I knew seven was a good rating. So I was getting a little bit of a fist pump. Um, shortly after that, I got invited to Southeast trials and then speeding through that story I made southeast and then the plan was to play a number of games against the different regions but for whatever reason I think during that year I think it was 2012 we had terrible weather I think it was frozen pitches for a long long time um I think or either flooded or whatever so game after game got called off um even though we we spent weekends away together as a team, you know, s- sleeping over in hotels for three days at a time, training super hard, working on these patterns and, and gearing up for these games. The games never happened. I think there was one after another that got cancelled. Then they also tried to condense them down to a festival format to for all the games to be played on on one day. And then that got cancelled. So then what do you do then? You can't condense the uh, the regional teams down based on ability because you haven't seen everyone perform yet. So everyone from all the regions got invited to a trial um, weekend at Stowe School. Oh, wow. I mean, that is one of the most unique experiences that I've ever experienced in terms of a trial process. There were so many guys there trying to figure out you know, where you stood and where you ranked in terms of the other players in your position it was just you're constantly on edge and you're not just thinking down to the rugby experience either you're thinking about how you speak to the coaches how you know what kind of nutrition you're having at breakfast lunch and dinner and when the coaches are walking around and looking at what you're eating (laughs) I definitely wasn't choosing the bacon and the croissants I was choosing the bowl of muesli because look at me I'm taking my nutrition seriously it got to that granular level where I was so just I don't know just obsessed with Every single bit of criteria, I wanted to do well. I had to do better than my uh, my opposite man. I remember trying to go to bed early just to make sure that I was fresh for the next day. I think we had four days in a row where we were training and we were competing against each other. And it was a super intense environment. It was just, there was no let up for those four days. We played games against each other. And I felt like I fared well. And on the third day was when they called us into a room. I think they... They siphoned off different groups. They they read out team sheets, and we're all trying to look around as the names are getting called out. Okay, who have I been? Who have I been selected with? And as I think, as more and more team, um, as more and more names get read out, you start to try and or you start to picture who's made the top England team um, and who hasn't made it. When my name got read out, I didn't want to be presumptuous because. To be honest, I didn't know, know a lot of the other guys, but I knew that some of the guys I've been selected with were great players. And I thought, okay, well, this might be it. They called us into the gym. Um, I think it was on the Saturday uh, and the Sunday was when we were due to be picked up. And they announced to us then that we'd made the England team. And I, I suppose I get emotional when I think about it because it's just something that over the last three years, I'd been working so hard at my rug- rugby and my craft and so much effort had been put into it from a logistic standpoint, from my parents' effort, from my own effort. 
um, the amount of games that I'd played hard and the county, you know, county, regional training sessions, the weekends away, sacrifices. I mean, I don't, I don't tend to talk about it very much, but if you think about a normal kind of teenage childhood, the amount of parties that I passed up on, the amount of normal teenage experiences, summers, all of that that I passed up on to just play rugby and get better at my craft, I felt like, oh, if I like all that work was for something. And um, yeah, and so they announced it and just literally my my head was going to explode if I didn't tell someone. Um, it then got to, to Sunday. Um, I think we had a relaxed kind of run through just learning the kind of patterns of play that we'd be kind of playing when we... We had the two international fixtures in Easter to look forward to. And then on the Sunday afternoon, um, my dad picked me up. I think he tells a story where he went out to the pitches and he was looking around at all the kids who were out on the field. Actually, the England team that I was in were in the gym. Um, so we weren't out on the pitch training and um, he was trying to spot me and he thought, oh, this can't be good. Uh, is he injured? Because I was quite injury prone. I had a chronic groin problem at the time. And he thought, yeah, that's just classic that he gets injured at this time. He went into the physio cabin to check if I was there, naturally. And the physio said, oh, yeah, no, he's actually with the uh, with the other group. And dad said, well, is that a good thing? And they said, yeah, you could deem that as a good thing. So he still wasn't completely sure. And I don't know whether people listening to this will be too young to uh, remember only fools and horses or to have seen only fools and horses but there's a scene in a, in that tv show where del boy and rodney the two main characters after a lifetime of striving to become a millionaire they inherit a watch which is then sold at auction for five million and they very slowly walk out of the um <laughs> out of the out of the auction room where it's been sold into their car and it was a similar tale to what what happened. So dad and I walked very slowly to the car with all my stuff. I said, I'll tell you in a minute, I'll tell you in a minute, because I knew that he was going to go mad. And we sat in my car and I said, dad, I'm in the England team. That car was rocking. Much like it only falls to horses, I thought we were going to tip the thing over. It was, um, it was one of the proudest moments of my life to be able to say that. And... Uh, and it felt like all of those years of hard work had paid off. So, um, yeah, I was so happy to have made the team. Speeding on to the actual um, time with England, it was just from the minute that we got to the airport where we actually flew to Italy to play the under-17s, all stashed up in our England kit. Um, we, we'd actually had two warm-up games before playing against Wasps under-17s and Leicester Tigers. Um, where we could kind of start putting things into practice and you know start to shape up okay well what does the starting team look like um, but when we got to the airport all wearing our England stuff you know proud as a peacock kind of strutting through the airport everyone kind of looking looking to see what it's all about even on the airplane they announced that we you know we uh, we were off to to play the Italians and you know that was just it was a really cool experience for me as a 16 year old you just you know it's just stuff that you know is beyond your wildest dreams that you think is going to happen and you know I, I look back on it with with I suppose I still get excited speaking about it um landing then in Italy we were pretty much training quite solidly um for preparation of the Italy game you know when you're younger I think they like to make a grand occasion of everything there because they don't know if you're ever going to experience something like that again so I remember everything was made a big deal out of but again I absolutely loved that because I thought oh, this is just so great what a fantastic experience I remember the the uh, the awarding of the first cap um, and I got announced to be starting at number eight which is my preferred position against the Italians and presenting that share with my my dad my family came out to uh, to watch the game as well as my family friends the Beltons who were watching me kind of get my get my shirt and and then onto the game itself I mean everything that you can imagine from um kind of a rugby experience that you'd want from you know the preparation of the game the build-up you know the night before watching a, a compilation of all the best bits of training and our, our our game so far and getting us amped up to you know the granular detail of you know how they want us to play and how you know what our specific focuses are on into the changing rooms where 
all the nutrition, all the kit was laid out. It was perfect. Um, and getting there, just getting into your own head, making sure that you're focused for the game, um, knowing your role completely. And um, it was the first time that you you actually saw the full white kit laid out in front of you. Um, and that was just, I mean, it just put a massive smile on my face. I think I couldn't hide my excitement. It probably was very, very uncool. I was probably the the most uncool England under-16 player that, that there's been. Um, but I just loved every minute of it. I was really surprised when we were waiting to get strapped up for taping that there was a guy who was obviously a lot more accustomed to this kind of environment than me. He had his headphones on, was playing reggae, literally looking as cool as you like, shocked that it was a fly half. Um, but I was totally in awe because I was like, how can you be this chilled out? I'm gonna, I'm climbing off the walls. I'm ready to play for England. This is amazing. Um, we went out, had a pretty decent game. Um, we ended up winning the game 31-20. Um, you know, really great, really great game. I, I, I'd enjoyed it. Singing the national anthem beforehand. I knew, I think they did stitch us up because they played the elongated version, which they love to do um, in foreign countries. They, there's two verses to God Save the Queen. And so there was a little bit of an awkwardness when none of us knew the second verse and they just kept playing it on. But there you go. Um, but, you know, definitely you know, one of the proudest moments of my life representing your country singing the national anthem. And then on to, on to the Wales game, who came back. And then I think it was about four days later, we were on to play the Welsh. That was, I suppose, mixed emotions for me. So I got it got announced that probably due to rotation, I then had to sit on the bench for the Wales game. And I was disappointed because my dad had told me how many people were coming down to watch me. And I thought, oh, if I, if I only get on for 10, 15 minutes here, this is going to be really embarrassing because they've all come down and expected a bit of a, expected a bit of a performance. So I was disappointed when it came to the cap um, and shirt handing out ceremony. I was, I was really disappointed. I couldn't really hide it. And, you know, I think dad was on the phone to me when I told him, you know, I'm really gutted and he thought, yeah, come on, come on, change your play for England. Like this, this is no bad thing. You know, you, you're going to get some game time, keep your chin up. You know, it's not really time to be disappointed because you've got a game to play. So, um, so I, I had, you know, I had to have a rapid change of heart and um, luckily, unluckily, and, you know, I've, well, one of my good friends at the time, Guy Borodell, who was playing second row, got injured. I think it was about 15 minutes into the game. So I then got subbed on and played the rest. Um, now, if I can if I can just have a, a little moment of, uh, of gloating. We were at the point in the game, second half, I think in, we were up. We had the Welsh under the hammer for most of the game. And then there was an opportunity... In the very early stages of the second half, I knew the, the fly half was sat very deep. And so I shot out of the line because I knew that exactly where it was going. He threw, I think, I think his hands went first and his head followed um, because he definitely didn't see me. And I caught an interception to race away for a try from about 50 metres out. And I... <laughs> The whole way, I'm thinking, I'm not getting there. I'm not getting there. Someone's going to catch me. So I'm looking over my shoulder the whole way and these wingers are trying to catch me. Thankfully, I had the uh, the leg stretch um, to get there. And I, I think I, uh, when I look back on the video, I think I sl- started my dive on the five metre line, but thankfully it was wet. So it carried me all the way through um, and I scored for England. Um, and eventually the result was 39-34. So that was the last points we scored. So I always like to say, you know, without my try, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, you know, it was a fantastic feeling. Um, I've never experienced that kind of euphoria in any form of life. That There is nothing that can replace that feeling of scoring a try for your country. Um, scoring a try in general is just great, really. I mean, I haven't had as many in recent years as I'd like. So definitely something I'm going to be looking to, uh, to work on for Stortford. But um, yeah, being able to score for your country is just indescribable. And I remember all my teammates coming, racing over, jumping on me. You know, what a fantastic feeling. So my England experience was just, you know, as any boy could imagine, you know, I, I relished and loved every opportunity of it. The, the ceremony around it, the tradition, the cap ceremony, the training. I mean, the level of training, I absolutely loved it. 
um, rooming with guys that you know you would you would have never been put with before. I mean, I room with guys that are now playing professional rugby. Um, you know, I, we develop bonds, you know, in a short space of time. That if I saw any of the guys for a pint now, I know that we'd pick up just like it was yesterday. And you know, I, I look back and I think what a fantastic time. I'm so honoured and privileged to be able to have had that opportunity. Funny enough, straight after. Um, that England bit and the win against Wales, you think, oh, massive high win against Wales, international cap. I then went on to have to study uh, an intensive Easter course for my failing maths and English um, <laughs> exams. So literally the day after I was sat in a room for the students on my Easter break talking about physics and maths. I mean, when you talk about come downs, I mean, come on. So um, but there you go, no, it was uh, all, for, all for the best in the end. After after the England experience, I think things probably changed a little bit from uh, from an England perspective. So I knew that they were under seventeen, uh, or there would be the, the question as to whether I get retained for under seventeen. I got the call from one of my coaches actually in the summer, and I was told I wasn't going to be invited back for the camp. Um, obviously, a massive blow. At the time, it felt like the end of the world. It felt like, oh, that's my rugby career over. You know, they don't want me. I'm not good enough. You know, why has everyone else been um, asked back and, and I haven't been? And you know, it was it was one. Of, it was the first major setback that I'd kind of suffered in my career to to that point because to have experienced the high and and to have thought seemingly, you know, you think looking back, you know, like, but I scored a try. You know, I thought I had a good performance and. Um, not really understanding why I hadn't got selected the the second time. I think I was in in denial a little bit. I think all the way through, I'd always focused in in, in my career on my attacking side of the game compared to my defence, and that was one of the biggest things that they picked up on. And that I didn't make enough hits that were absolutely dominant. I mean, playing in a team with Sam Underhill, who just went round absolutely melting blokes left, right, centre. I mean, it's very easy to. Uh, to look like you're not putting in a defensive shift, <laughs> but I'm not playing that on Sam by any means. So yeah, it was one of the the first times I had to kind of recover from a setback, um, and it was difficult. It was difficult. Um, I think if it weren't for the fact that I had a new challenge to look forward to in terms of moving schools, it would have really sunk me to to quite a low position because in the in the surrounding area in the town, once you you kind of make it, you, you state a statement internationally and you know you, you get I suppose the the local newspapers would have been putting it in the papers at the time and so you got a few more eyes on you than normal especially around the rugby club family friends you know there's a lot of expectation that built and that was something that I think that by not being selected back for under 17s I was just I was quite embarrassed I was a little bit like oh well what what are people going to think you know I've just play for England now I've not been invited back you know how how am I going to look to other people and something over time that you kind of realize okay well that you know it doesn't people's opinion of you doesn't matter because at the end of the day I love that experience I put in as much as I could and unfortunately I didn't make it to under 17s or under 18s in the end but um you know so I suppose I think I, I'm I worked it up to be a lot more in my head than it was due to the fact that I was worried about what other people think. But it comes with maturity that you learn, I suppose, it you know, it doesn't matter what other people think of you and um and, and to kind of just just get on with it really. Um that's that's the biggest thing that I had to just get on get on with it and crack on because I had a new challenge in terms of going to play for my new school, which was Harrow. Um, which I couldn't kind of afford to dwell on. I had to crack on with my rugby. Um, I also was still playing with Saracens and I couldn't afford to let my performances drop there because I was still absolutely um, motivated to try and get a contract. For the next um, two years of my life, you know, the Harrow experience was absolutely fantastic. I mean, I was I was very privileged. The, the reason why that came about um, after my kind of England journey, I was, again, extremely privileged and still to this day very very humbled by the fact that the head of rugby um he approached me and, and said you know would I be interested in coming for a tour around the school I said yeah you know well, you know what can it hurt and 
told told my parents who didn't really know about Harrow at the time. Um, I'm sure a few people won't even know what Harrow is now, but um, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a large public school, um, quite quite well renowned. And um, we rocked up this place and went for a tour, and I thought, wow, this is just next level. Like I've never seen anything like it in my life, and. I thought, you know, well, like, you know, rugby really can open doors, but um, I thought this is this is crazy. I wasn't actually going to be going there for the longest time, but I think, you know, it left such a lasting impression. And um, my dad, you know, looked at me one day. He said, "You really want to go to this school, don't you?" I said, "Yeah, I do." He said, "Okay, we we'll do it." And um, you know, fortunately enough, I was, you know, I managed to get a bit of a, a scholarship to go there. Um, and I was privileged enough to uh, to go and play my rugby there and, and study there during my sixth form, which I'm still massively grateful for. You know, Jesse Coulson, who was my head of rugby at Harrow, for for bringing me there. It's something that I always remember, and I've, I'm you know extremely privileged to have gone through that that um, that two years uh, of my life. Um, the first year, I didn't actually realise how difficult public school rugby was going to be because the first year, I, I really was underwhelming. I think, I'm sure Jesse was probably thinking, oh, who is this guy? You know, saw one thing um, in Easter this year and now when I brought him to the school, um, so, so, so seeing something completely different, I think it's probably to the fact that when I played uh, at my old school, you know, school rugby, you know, when you're playing at a local level, you're not playing the top tier public schools. Yeah, you're probably not challenged that much and you don't think too much of school rugby. But when everyone gets a bit older, when everyone is in sixth form, you know, people start going to the gym. The, these top public schools have got a bit more resource to chuck at it and um, it's a lot more organised. So I really had to adapt quite quickly and um, I had a few good performances, but yeah, it really wasn't an outstanding year for me by any stretch. And had a conversation with my head coach, you know, he's saying, you know, you really need to kind of buck your ideas up here. I, I we, we managed to, so again, fortunate to go um, on tour with Harrow to, to Australia, you know, one of the best times in my life, you know, fantastic opportunity to just go out and play rugby in the sun for two and a half weeks. It's where I played some of my most free flowing, um, adventurous rugby. And, and um, I remember myself and Harry O'Hara, who's my you know best friend at the time at Harrow, gymming for about well gymming twice a day for two months in the lead up to that tour. So I felt you know let's go in super fit um, and go and make make a mark. So you know that Harrow team that I went with, you know some of the best guys um, and best teammates a guy could ask for, and we had a fantastic time there for for two and a half weeks and. You know, what what a fantastic time playing against, you know, some really great Australian schools. Got absolutely humbled by Brisbane Boys College. Some of the guys that are playing for, wow. I mean, you've never seen such physical 18-year-olds. I remember coming away from that experience feeling quite battered and bruised, thinking, okay, yeah, this Southern Hemisphere rugby game is a lot different to the one that we play up in England. Um, but yeah, a, a great experience nonetheless. Then something that kind of changed everything. So I, under 18 level, uh, I've spoken to, about my Saracens experience in terms of the academy premiership. One thing that I was really struggling with was my nerves before a game and how much it was distracting me on a daily basis. That you know, it's coming up to the end of you know the under 18s the end of the academy time. Every every day, every week, I was thinking you know the prospect of getting a professional contract was always on my head. It was building up so much pressure, and especially when. I accepted that I wasn't the most academic. I didn't know how well I was going to be doing in my exams with all the rugby commitments. I, I, I really just didn't know what was going to happen in my future. I, I, th- I think I put a lot of weight and pressure on myself to get the rugby contract because I really didn't know what other options there were going to be. And, and all along um, through my Saracens journey, my coaches had kind of said, you know, you're in good running, you know, you just need to improve X, Y, Z. Bit, you know, parts of you a game, um, you're there or thereabouts. It came to the point before every single Saracens game, I was just shaking, my 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 legs were shaking. I remember vividly before playing Exeter Chiefs, my my whole body was shaking and my coach pulled me aside and said, you need to calm down, you know, you need to relax, play your game. And I said, you know, what's going on? I said, I'm just thinking about if I have a bad game, I'm not going to get a contract. And 
He was just saying you can't be worrying about that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, it was difficult to put that at the back of your head because then you know, you're thinking if you get this contract, that's that's a whole different life, and it's something that you've been working. You know, I would have been working to that point for four years. You know, every single week just putting into rugby, and um, so it was a difficult thing to put out of my mind. I think the coaches thought that. I was uh, suffering in terms of my mental space and they probably needed to to put the issue to rest. So one day they asked me to come in uh, early doors in the morning into um, St. Albans to have the conversation. And I thought, this is it. They're, they're going to, this is the day they're going to offer me the contract. You know, this is, the, this is the first day of the rest of my life. You know, I, I can't, you know, so a lot of optimism, but a hell of a lot of nerves because it still could have been going either way, leading, going into that meeting and stepped in and met my dad for the meeting. I remember stepping into the, uh, stepping in two of my coaches there and the overall v- <laughs> the overall feeling was not a great one. It was, it didn't feel full of energy and I kind of was bracing myself for the worst. Um, the first words that left his mouth were, I'm just going to, break it to you, Thax, we're not going to offer you a contract. And much like in a in a movie where someone's delivered a bad news, where it's like a high-pitched tinny noise and like, just like, like I just completely clocked out. I was just staring into the abyss, just thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do now? And obviously just so many things happening in your head, you know, why has this happened? What could I have done better? Like, you know, a million and one things racing around your head. And I was just kind of sitting in that chair, sinking into it, thinking, I can't believe it. I was, I was devastated. And, um, they, they did say, you know, go to Loughborough, which is my uh, university of choice. Um, keep developing your game and we'll see what happens. And and that was pretty much it. They said that I, I could still play out my games with Saracens and, um, if I wanted to, and then, you know, that would be it really. And I'd still, I could still have access to SNC coaches and things like that. I did politely decline. I think it was mainly due to the fact that I think it would be too tough for me to go in to the changing room, knowing that, um, I hadn't got a contract or whatever I did from that moment on would, wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have had a contract. Maybe it would have been a good time to you know show my real appetite and thought no even in adversity I still want to come and play I want to show what I can do but I was just in the headspace where I was just defeated and it probably knocked my confidence a lot it it definitely made me fall out of love with rugby I was kind of looking around seeing guys that you know I felt like I'd done a lot more um in terms of my my commitment to the game I was a student of the game I always thought about rugby you know, I was I was analysing everything. I, I threw a lot of my life throughout my teenage years into rugby, uh, and it seemed to kind of um, you know leave me with nothing more than the kind of education that I had, which again was no bad thing. But when you're thinking about specifically rugby, you know, it was it was a really kind of heartbreaking thing to to go through. So Loughborough was my choice because of its really great reputation around rugby. It has a fantastic program with a great reputation. Dave Morris, who was the the head coach there, uh, invited me to the preseason in the in the first summer um, before, so the summer after A levels, because he he already knew, you know, I'd, I'd already reached out to him to see if I can come along to some training sessions. I was I was keen. I wanted to put in a good impression. Also during that summer, I would met my first girlfriend. I also thought this is the first summer I've had in my teenage years where I haven't had to play rugby and it's actually also a, a time that I can just go have fun go be normal not have to have blood sweat and tears pouring out of me through SNC sessions and combat conditioning and fighting each other and gymming so maybe it was a mistake of, of me to do it I don't like to have a lot of regrets as a person because I think things that we do that we might have changed or or mistakes that we've made or learning opportunities rather than things that you wish that you could go back and go back and change. So I didn't go. Uh, and that probably put me um, on the back foot straight away when joining Loughborough. I think it definitely set a bad precedent, not only with the coach, but also in my own head. And from there, I think it just, you know, my, my relationship with rugby really just spiraled. It, 
you know, I, I think because I just hadn't seen the the rewards directly from a rugby point of view, I then didn't want to put any more effort into rugby and I wasn't going to. And I thought, okay, all these things about uni that you hear, the fact that you can go party, you know, it's a big first year is basically a year long party and, you know, you're going to meet loads of people and you're going to go drinking and partying the whole time. I just got completely sucked into that kind of side of things. When I was with my girlfriend at the time, um, which only kind of lasted that year, but, um, you know, the focus was so not on rugby, you know, not pushing me to go and be the best version of myself and quite, I had quite an immature outlook on life. And I think I just, I was driven away from the game. When I first joined Loughborough, I went through the trial process as I, I made the rugby club. But even during the sessions, I just felt my heart wasn't in it. You know, I was playing for the Bucks two side, the Bucks 2 league, you know, for, from a Loughborough point of view, was quite... I mean, we were playing against people like Coventry and winning 127-0. I mean, it was a league that we should have been winning 10 times out of 10 because of the quality that was on show. You had people coming from all around the country who used to play for academies, county, regional, you name it. You, you had a, a wealth of talent there. And in, in train, I remember in training sessions, I was mucking around because I just thought, well, you know... I think subconsciously, I thought no matter what I put in here, you know, in the end, it's not going to lead to anything. And I just couldn't shake that that mental side of things where I, I just, I think I was just stuck in a rut of, you know, not wanting to give my all, you know, because it was going to take up more of my life and it's going to lead to lead to nothing again. I then got injured just before I was about to make my box one debut. And because... <laughs> because uh, there's no free physio for people that weren't Bucks One or um, the top level players at Loughborough, I would have had to pay for my own physio treatment. And as a student, you don't get a, a lot of money, as I'm sure everyone knows. Um, and so I just didn't want to pay for it. I didn't want to pay for it. I thought I'd, uh, I'd go and do rehab um, by myself, um, although that was mainly consisting of um, going and dancing on dance floors rather than Nordic stretches and um, and all that kind of stuff to build up strength in my legs. So um, I probably came back from it even weaker than when um, before I got my injury. I then made a bit of a comeback and before then doing my hamstring again after doing some Romanian deadlifts in the gym. And that ended my, my first year at Loughborough. So to cut a long story short, my university experience was kind of littered with moments of playing rugby, but never really sinking my heart into it. I then had another opportunity with Hertfordshire under twenties to go and play some reputa- representational stuff. Now I was nowhere near my kind of peak of my abilities and my fitness. I gained a lot of weight at uni after kind of being lost to drinking sessions and being comfortable, just, you know, not really having to go training anymore or doing sporadic gym sessions, but never really doing any cardio because I just felt like it was too much effort and I didn't want to. And so it, you know, I, I still I still managed to maintain some of my talent, um, but I definitely wasn't playing at the peak of my powers. Somehow, um, throughout that Hertfordshire under twenty experience, we managed to get through to the semi finals. I mean, we had some really really talented players. It was kind of like a barbarians team full of Bishop Stortford players, as well as some guys that we played with down the years at Hertfordshire, um, and a really fantastic bunch of blokes. Um, we we reached the semi final where unfortunately we lost to a very very strong Yorkshire side who then went on to win the final at Twickenham. But even then, you know, that that wasn't really enough to to spark my love for rugby again. It it was something that I was doing because it was a hobby. It wasn't something that I was looking to particularly pursue further. And then I, I managed to also make the, the South East training squad um, where, again, I, I fell short. And I think my fitness was the thing that tripped me up. And, you know, that's something that you can't lie to yourself about. You might be able to maintain... So, you know, bits and tricks around talent and skill, but fitness is something you can't lie to yourself and you're going to get found out. And I definitely got found out on the pitch. Um, having only, I only, I think, played 25 minutes and the ball was in play for about half of that. I also then tripped someone up and uh, and made a, not not a great showing of myself. Um, so I, I yeah, obviously didn't get invited to play for the, the uh, England Counties under 20 side. So... <laughs> Throughout, throughout my university experience, it was just full, full of sporadic rugby appearances, playing for various teams. You know, don't get me wrong. Some of those times 
fantastic. I played, uh, you know, rugby at Loughborough with some absolutely fantastic guys. Um, had some ridiculous experiences doing initiations, naked bus journeys, you know, ridiculous stuff. Um, and, you know, I always will, will remember those things fondly. Going up to St. Andrews as the captain of the Bucks Threes team, um, spending the night in Dundee, uh, eating your McDonald's at 12 o'clock before a match day. I mean, some some of the things that, that we uh, we used to do at, up at Loughborough, it, you know, it was fantastic. I, I, I loved it up there. Um, but it was just not enough to really spark my passion again for the, for the game. I, I still felt aggrieved. I still, at the end of the day, I still felt sorry for myself. I think that's something that I've only been able to admit recently, probably over the last couple of years, is that for a long time I was feeling sorry for myself. I didn't adopt the right attitude after experiencing that, you know, um, extreme kind of uh, disappointment. And and I just think I did, I didn't adopt the the right mindset. So it took me up until really when I finished university, when I returned back to Bishop Stortford, to really start throwing myself at it again. I felt okay. I'm coming back to a place that I know. I'm coming back to people I know. Um, and now it's really time to give it a, give it a second shot. And thankfully, you know, the guys at Bishop Stortford were fantastic in terms of working with me you know, being patient with me, I still took a a while to get up to speed. You know, I was coming from a place where I think during my third year at university, I was weighing about 125 kilos and that was bad weight. So um, you can imagine the type of, you know, mode I was in if I'm now around about 112 kilos and, you know, it's probably still a bit of bad weight to shake, admittedly. But uh, but you know, feeling feeling a lot better about myself these days. But they, you know, they they are the guys. So Stortford coming back, um, have given me the first team opportunity. You know, they've made rugby fun again. I think I've got myself in the right mindset. I think I've now taken it as it as a new chance to reinvigorate my my career and um, be able to play rugby with guys that I enjoy with coaches that I absolutely love learning from um, in, in a place where I know everyone around that watches and um, it's a fantastic community vibe around around Bishop Stortford. So I'm eternally grateful for um, people like Andy Long, Marcus Cattell, Tom Coleman for giving me uh, an opportunity with the first team um, at the time that they did because it really gave me the spur to, to keep improving and, and I've still got so much to learn. I've still got and that, that's that's really exciting for me. I've got, still got so much to learn in my career, so much to improve on still. And I know that um, I'm definitely, you know, I'm willing now and, and want to fulfill my potential because I can know I can still do it. I think to conclude, when I look back on my rugby career to this point, it's full of amazing highs and some lows as well. When I said that I had got nothing out of rugby, I think... At the time, I felt like I'd got nothing, but it's far from it. I've got so much from rugby. It's it's crazy. The amount of values that it's instilled in me, the amount of experiences that I've had, the amount I've learned from different people, the, you know, the, the amounts of different types of people that I've come into contact with, the stories that I've heard, the, you know, the things that I've learned from them, um, learned about myself, but how I can push myself, how I can test myself mentally like the my you know the fact that if you can switch flick that switch in your brain you can access a whole different part of your motivation and um it's a it's just something that means so much to me but I still don't look back at that time where I fell out of love with rugby as necessarily a bad thing I think it's taught me to appreciate what I've got now I think I needed to go through that period to explore other bits of life and also to see what I don't want and what I don't want out of life to just kind of throw away this opportunity I've got with rugby and um, I'd say going back to my original purpose of recording this and hopefully you found that interesting I think some people will would have been part of my rugby journey and not experienced or heard about some of the things that I've talked about I mean I've probably still left a lot on the table and I'd love you know, if anyone's going through the same as I was in terms of suffering some lows and questioning your own ability, you know, not sure if you fit into to certain clubs or, um, you know, anything rugby related, I'd love to talk about it. But hopefully it's been interesting. Hopefully um, it, it shows you that 
even when there are lows and you know things like when I got dropped and didn't get selected for the England under 17s but I, I then got on with it and still found fantastic experiences on tour and um, at school and and you know even with with Loughborough as well um, even when you know I don't get selected for the teams I want to at university and gain weight and get rejected time and time again from di- different places there is still the ability to turn it around and there's still going to be an opportunity for you somewhere. So I'd urge for everyone to keep persevering through, through that hard time. Um, now when it comes to the mental challenges, there are, um, there are fantastic people to help. Um, I'm very grateful that Stortford set up a, uh, the Joker program, which helps people and players think, speak about their mental health. So any challenges that you're having mentally, there, there are people that want to hear about your story. Loose Heads, also a charity that are doing unbelievable work. Um, but if you want to progress yourself as a player, go speak to your coaches, go and just talk to people. Uh, and if you're worried that you may have fallen off um, or if you want to reignite, if you want to re-engage with a passion of sport, it doesn't have to be rugby with anything, then it's never too late. You can do it. Um, and I'm going to really enjoy the next step to come. I cannot wait for rugby to be back on March the 29th. Super excited. Um, and yeah, let's, let's see. I mean, I'm going to keep pushing myself. I'll, I'll probably have sporadic updates around rugby and, and what's been going on. Um, I'm sure there'll be some rugby players, current or ex teammates that are going to listen to this and probably have a chuckle, but um, it is what it is. You know, I'm enjoying this podcast journey. I, I'm, I've enjoyed um, sharing my story today. Uh, and if if you've enjoyed it too, um, feel free to to drop a like or comment or whatever um, happens on these podcasts and platforms. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today. Have a fantastic rest of your weekend or whenever you're listening to this. And we will speak again very soon. <laughs>